Welcome to the first of our new series, One on One, John Clayton's series of interviews with interesting people in and around the South Bay. We're very honored today to have a very distinguished gentleman with us. It is Francis J. Hurrigan, a judge, and his background is absolutely extraordinary. He was a Los Angeles County Superior Court judge for 23 years, working for most of, most of the time at the Torrance Courthouse handling mostly criminal cases, some traffic and some juvenile stuff. And before he became that, he was a Los Angeles County District Attorney for 16 years. First of all, welcome Judge. Of all those things that you handled, what was the most interesting? I see here that you did murder, robbery, rape, child molestation and fraud. Of all those, which, which was the most interesting to you? I think uh, the most interesting were, of course, uh, the trials with a lot of uh, scientific testimony, uh, obviously uh, the murder cases, uh, they were more uh, lengthy, more complicated. Uh, I think those were the most interesting. When you dealt with murder cases, um, do you remember your first one and was it, uh, was it a bit intimidating? It was intimidating. Uh, fortunately, as you mentioned in uh, my background, uh, for 16 years I'd had the opportunity to work in trial courts as a prosecuting attorney. So the courtroom was not a strange environment for me, but it's a little different uh, rather than being one of the attorneys to be the judge presiding. So of course I was, uh, I'm not sure if I want to use the word intimidated, but certainly uh, on, on the alert and uh, wanted to, uh, most important thing a judge wants to do is try a case, uh, get a verdict, make sure that uh, both sides feel they've had a fair hearing, and uh, that's, uh, that, that was what I tried to do with, uh, with every case I had. For our viewers, you can see that Judge Hurrigan is wearing his black robe, and uh, I've known the judge for about a year now, and when we decided to do this interview, I asked him if he would wear uh, the black robe. Uh, was that always a sort of de rigueur thing that you had to wear every time you appeared as a judge? Uh, actually, John, it's the law. A, uh, the law? <laughs> yes, the uh, California government code requires that any time a judge uh, sits in his, in his or her official capacity that they wear a robe. And so uh, so many of our traditions in the law go back to England. Uh, we've uh, got a lot of our uh, ideas from them how to run our court system and uh, the judges there uh, wear robes. We don't wear the wigs like they do, but uh, the robe has to be worn when a judge is ruling on a case. For our viewers, the judge just mentioned a very interesting thing. Uh, I've been in this great country of America 48 years and the judge mentioned how a lot of American law is based on English law, and you mentioned the Whigs. For our viewers that don't know this, most, in fact, as far as I know, all English judiciary wear that gray sort of wig that, in a way, seems to me kind of, I don't know, antiquated, but it's very British. What, what do you think of that? I mean, could you ever see American jurists wearing wigs like that? I, I, I could not see it. Uh, I did have an opportunity. We visited the courts in uh, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia one time, and uh, uh, during a break I talked to one of the court staff and explained my background. So uh, during, during a recess, the judge uh, invited me into his chambers and let me try on his wig. And I'm glad I didn't have to wear one because they're not very comfortable for someone not used to it. Did you get a picture? I got, oh yes, of course, I got a picture. Uh, he loaned me his robe and uh, put the wig on, and I have that in uh, one of our photo Probably albums. Probably very, makes you very hot. Oh yes, oh yes. You know, when we were coming here, the judge shared a very interesting story with me about, as you see, all you see is this black robe and then the judge's tie. What was that story you told me about? Um, well, uh, as I said, the judge wears his robe, and uh, the attorneys and the parties are usually dressed more appropriately, coats and ties or whatever. And uh, at a judicial training session uh, to break up the audience, the judge came out and had his robe on, and uh, it looked to be appear from a distance that he had a, a good shirt, a white shirt, and a tie. And all of a sudden, he whipped off his robe, and the, uh, it turned out it was a T-shirt that had been... Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, given one of those designs. And he said, this is my summer wear under my robe, so. <laughs> um, you mentioned an interesting thing to me, uh, and I'm sure a lot of our audience don't know this. You can be brought to justice or fined by when you're summoned to jury, by not coming. What yes, is that? Yes, uh, well, one of the uh, <clears throat> great things about our court system is that the cases are usually decided by people from the community, jurors. 
And uh, so as a citizen of a community, you are summoned to court to serve as a trial juror. But we all know that people have another life besides uh, being a trial juror. So sometimes people will ignore their jury summons and not come in. Uh, in the state of California, if that happens, if you miss a uh, summons a second time, you get a notice from the court. And you are then ordered to come to the court and explain why you haven't uh, appeared for your jury summons. Many people even ignore that summons, but what happens then is there's a hold put on your driver's license uh, so that when you go in to apply for a driver's license, you're going to get then get ordered to the court to clear that hold. But the people who come in have the right to appear before a judge and explain why it is they didn't come in. <clears throat> sometimes the reasons are quite valid. Uh, sometimes they aren't. Uh, if a person willfully fail, fail, fails to appear for jury duty, they can't be fined an amount of dollars. Uh, as I said, it's uh, just a way of... Uh, reminding people that uh, how important jury duty is. I think the interesting thing about jury duty today is that there used to be a time, you know, really not that long ago, where when you got that infamous, you know, summons to participate in a jury, a lot of people said, well, I'm too busy, or I'm this or that and the other. And now, basically, as far as I know, in California, it is a, what, mandatory civic duty? Yes, there, there are no <laughs> excuses for jury duty. Uh, if you get a summons, uh, even I as a judge got summoned for jury duty. Uh, one time uh, as a lawyer I got summoned. Now both of those occasions I showed up, went through the orientation, and for some reason uh, I suspect uh, the jurors didn't want, or the uh, attorneys didn't want a judge to sign their case from the jury box. Uh, I did not get selected. But uh, it, it's really gotten much simpler. It's one day or one trial. And if the trial is over seven days, then people can get excused. Uh, but if a trial is seven days or less, unless you have a very good excuse, you're going to have to serve. Uh, and the whole idea is to get a cross-section of the community deciding the cases. Um, you, I see, also judged some traffic situations. And I'm sure when you judge traffic things, you probably heard every excuse under the sun. Well, judge, I don't have this, I can't do that, and, you know, maybe the officer didn't see me. I mean, you probably heard every excuse under the sun. I have to tell you, John, uh, those were among uh, my most difficult uh, cases. Because, really? Uh, well, you're touching, you're touching uh, uh, just ordinary citizens uh, who uh, get in, you know, come in contact with the court system because they've got a citation. And uh, police officers are human beings. They make mistakes. Uh, not every citation they write uh, may be uh, valid under the law. So uh, on those situations, you would listen to the police officer. You would listen to the motorist. Uh, you would try to uh, make a, a fair decision. But uh, uh, you do. Uh, it, it is, it's rather ticklish uh, on those traffic tickets. Without giving away any judicial secrets, when you were judging a case, as you heard all the evidence was your mind sort of turning over as to, you know, how am I going to judge this? And am, I, am I favored by the defense? Am I, I mean, your mind's obviously working the whole time. Well, initially, when a case comes to you, you try to gather some overview of it to decide whether there's something about the case and your personal background. Uh, maybe you know one of the parties. There may be some other circumstance where your family or a close friend has been a victim of that type of crime where you ask yourself, can I really be fair uh, uh, just, uh, presiding over this case? But then, once you start the trial, and this was the most difficult transition from being an attorney to judge. Really? When you're an attorney, you know a lot about the case before you go to court. A judge knows very little about a case when it comes before uh, the court. So the thing that uh, I had to do and, and colleagues had told me is, is just force yourself to keep an open mind. The prosecution goes first in a criminal case, the defense goes second. In a civil case, the person suing the plaintiff goes first, then the defense. So you have to keep an open mind throughout the trial, as much as that's humanly possible. And I, I reminded myself uh, of that requirement each and every time I heard a case, is hold back, listen, and then make your ruling. I'm sure our viewers would be intrigued to know, uh, what was it that decided you to become a judge? I mean. I can't imagine that when you were six or seven years old, a little boy, you said, hey, mom, I want to be a judge. What? <laughs> How did that whole thing come about? No, I was like many young boys. I wanted to be a baseball player when hey. I grew up. And, uh, but when I was in my uh, teenage years, my father had just started his legal career. 
and he took me to court with him uh, on vacations uh, during the summertime and over the holidays. And so that was obviously, I think, the influence for me to go into the legal profession. And then uh, while I was practicing law, as I said, I was in the courtroom most of the time. And I would look up and I'd say, you know, there's that judge, you know, and uh, it, would that ever be a possibility for me? And so it, it kind of grew in the back of my mind. It is a very tricky process. Uh, you, uh, you can uh, be appointed by the governor or run for election. Uh, but as my career developed and I gained experience, uh, I did put in my application and uh, I was very fortunate to get appointed uh, to the bench. So it was, it was something that evolved over my legal career, my, uh, my belief in my, myself that possibly I could do this job. As you know, I spent a, quite a large part of my life as an actor and I've often wondered, do you think there's some sort of part of being a judge that is, I don't want to say showbiz, but there is part of you as a judge having that acting thing. I mean, when they, what do they say, all rise, and then the judge comes in and you walk in, you must have a tremendous sense of power and um, to react. Do you, do you think there's a part of judges that is, is acting? I think, uh, I think it's, it's uh, an awareness of your situation. Uh, I know uh, in my situation, and it applies to many judges, uh, they worked in courts as an attorney. So they, they got used to that environment, just as an actor would get used to the stage. And, uh, but when you become a, a judge, uh, there's a cute little saying. They uh, say, don't believe just because you climb those uh, steps to uh, get up to the bench that you're three steps closer to heaven. <laughs> uh, you are still, uh, keep your humility, remember that you're... Uh, a servant of the people trying to render justice. Uh, this sense of power, uh, I almost was a little embarrassed when this uh, thing all rise uh, and I would take the bench. You were embarrassed? It, well, it's a bit of tradition. Uh, we would do it uh, just to get everyone's attention that, and we do it, that we would say in the presence of the flag of our country and recognizing the principles for which it stands, all rise uh, and then I'd be announced. So it was a reminder to the jurors you're here to do some very important work. You've been called to be an individual judge of this case. So uh, the power part, uh, I always tried, I tried, uh, I'm sure if you took a survey, uh, a lot of the lawyers would probably tell you that I maybe might have been cocky at times, but I always tried to be humble and just recognize how lucky I was to have the job. I must just share with our viewers that even though I've known this fine gentleman for, as I say, quite some time, I'm still, I'm still a bit intimidated sitting here with this gentleman in this black robe and sort of think, oh my dear, <laughs> oh my goodness, what have I done wrong? Uh, as we're coming to the end of our conversation, uh, there is a sign here. Do you want to hold that up, Judge? I mention that because uh, you and I both watch a wonderful television show called The Good Wife, which is a legal drama and... The writing is extraordinary, the acting is extraordinary, and you made a comment about since each show features a judge, are you or were you when you watched the show very perhaps overly critical of how the judges appear? Well, I think throughout my legal career, I always enjoyed watching movies or TV shows about the law. And so many of them, uh, it is entertainment. And so many of them uh, are not really accurate. But of course, I was always curious how the judge was going to be cast. Uh, uh, I always looked at the legal things that uh, developed in the shows. And uh, uh, did you ever say to yourself, you know, when they say, Your Honor, I object, do you have, did you ever say to yourself, I wouldn't have ruled that way? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Again, because it's entertainment, it's television. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, rulings and a lot of things that happened are not accurate, uh, but it's still, uh, the people, I tell you, so many people have such a fascination. When you think of all the books that are written about legal situations, uh, police in the courts and criminal cases, you think of all the television shows, movies, uh, uh, it's just a part of our society. Well, the last question is, do you miss the drama of the courtroom? Oh, of course. I think all of us who've had a career, uh, whatever field, uh, you miss your work once you uh, have concluded it. Uh, yes, I, w I miss it, but I was so privileged to have the long career I had. And uh, I think uh, 
many of us reach a point where uh, we kind of know it's time to step off the stage and enjoy another facet of life. And uh, so, yes, I miss it, but uh, I'm very happy uh, in retirement. The very last day that you did your very last thing, as it was proceeding, did you say to yourself, this is the last time I'm going to say this, this is the last time I'm going to do that, or were you solely focused on the particular situation at hand? I was focused on the situation, but uh, of course, uh, from the time I decided to, uh, to retire, I had about uh, a month, a month and a half to continue work. And I tried during that period of time just to savor uh, the wonderful situation I had. And yes, the last uh, time I drove to the courthouse, the last time I took the bench in my robe, uh, I remembered all those things and uh, I tried to really uh, take it all in. But as I said, uh, I knew that it was time to uh, let someone else take my place and, uh, and just savor the good memories I have. Judge, thank you very much for coming in today and sharing with us uh, your experience as a judge. And I hope you, our viewers, have found this an interesting uh, conversation and shown you how the judicial process works in this great country. Until next time, this is John Clayton with our new series of interviews one-on-one, -on -one, and I thank you for watching. Until next time, thank you for watching.